What's going on guys, it's CD Playa here, Chris Daniels. Today we'll be answering some of the questions that you have asked me over the past few days, both on YouTube and on Instagram. I'm so excited, there's so many good questions in here. And what I'll do in terms of order is start off with the YouTube questions, and then once I finish those, we'll get right into those Instagram questions. Before we dive in, just have a few questions for you guys. Would you be interested in seeing a history of me video? It wouldn't be the same style as like my history of fingerboarding documentary. Rather, it would be kind of like this um, with me talking in a vlog setting and sharing some things that happened over my fingerboarding history. So looking through all the comments, I'm not going to be really addressing any of the comments, just the questions for now. I appreciate any comments on the video. Um, I will be addressing those directly uh, and replies to those comments specifically. All right, we're gonna be answering our questions now. Let's start off with question number one, which is you, you back. Okay, question number two, any advice or have you seen this as a common issue? I have trouble doing tricks away from the edge of the table. Like I'm best when my elbow and forearm are able to be below my hand. So let me show you guys what uh, RW is talking about. He likes to be towards the edge of a table where his wrist or elbow is below the board itself. To me that tells me that they do a lot of fingerboarding either at their desk or when they're standing up at the edge of the table. And I don't have that issue but I can see how that would develop. When you fingerboard like that, it makes it really hard to fingerboard out in this end of the table as they're having trouble with. My advice here would be to practice fingerboarding standing up on a table lower than you. So like this for me, this is probably a little too low because I have to bend my body over. But get used to having your elbow a little bit higher, your wrist higher. There's certain tricks that are easier this way actually and some tricks that are harder. I haven't had this issue personally before. But I used to have trouble fingerboarding standing up back in the day because at least in the North American online scene, we all fingerboarded at our desk and we wouldn't be fingerboarding standing up. So it was really uncomfortable for me too initially to get used to fingerboarding standing up. But once I got that, it became easier to fingerboard out over here. Now you can still fingerboard like that. You can see how my wrist and elbow are touching the table. You can still do your tricks this way but this relies more on your finger motion then. I would just recommend slowly like working your fingerboarding out towards the middle of the table, forcing yourself to be outside of your comfort zone and just getting used to it. Do you see fingerboarding becoming more mainstream in the future? That is a good question. I do, it depends what you're talking about, whether it's baseline fingerboarding like Tech Tech Toys, which I do actually see that continuing to grow or the hardcore fingerboarding scene, which has been growing rapidly. And I think that's where the biggest growth is gonna be is in the introduction of the hardcore fingerboarding scene into the hobby itself. So I do see it becoming more popular. Um, typically in my experience, fingerboarding has kinda like gone up and then a little bit down, up and a little bit down, up and a little bit down. I think we're at this point though with TikTok and Instagram and YouTube Shorts bringing so much awareness to this hobby, I just don't see it ever getting lower than it is right now. Um, and it's at a really big high point for fingerboarding to be honest. So yeah, that's my answer to that question. Have you thought about bed raisers to make this setup a little more comfy to ride while standing? It doesn't look comfy bending over like that. That's so true, I hate bending over like that. Um, yes, I actually do have bed risers specifically for fingerboarding setups. I still have them here for some reason. I really should bring them here. Uh, that would make filming a lot easier. This table is pretty darn low if you haven't noticed. So like I'm on the lowest setting right now of this stool. Uh, and I prefer fingerboarding setting up honestly. And the next question also from Kodiak FPV, any advice for flipping out of a slide? So it depends what type of slide you're attempting to do, um, but they're all similar in how you accomplish the flip. What's really important, let's say you're doing a no slide and you want a nollie flip out, try dipping the board a little bit before you pop. 
This makes it pretty simple for you to get the leverage required and the pop required to do the flip out. Now the same thing applies when you're doing it from a front side tail slide, a little dip, and then pop. I didn't do it right there, but let's do it again. So you dip it a tiny bit. Um, when you're learning, you can exaggerate that more. Just get used to doing an ollie out of a tail slide like so, and just practice from an ollie from this position. That's my main advice. Now, if you're trying to do like a kickflip out of a backside tail slide or a frontside nose, those are a completely different technique, but it does allow you to do a little bit of a dip. For the backside tail flips out, a big part of that is twisting your board at a little bit of an angle, like that, dipping a little bit so your wheel catches. It's not gonna work here because you'll see like the rail doesn't work with the setup for that trick. But you would dip it down a little bit and tilt it a little bit so your wheel touches the obstacle and then you, when you pop, you kind of flick over and out and that tension and pressure from this angle will cause the board to do a kickflip rotation and, and finish that 90 degree rotation. Now for the nose slide, that would be a bit different from that technique too. You're gonna dip it down a little and then kind of do a pop and then use this finger right here to curl it. That's a really tough trick to do from a normal finger positioning. Uh, that's a hard one. Curious as to what happened during those times you weren't uploading. Kind of thought you have quit fingerboarding. Not gonna lie, one of the reasons that I stopped fingerboarding was because I just noticed that you and Elias just disappeared from the scene, but so glad you see at, but go, sorry. But so glad to see you at it again and upping those tricks. It really makes me want to fingerboard again. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was an interesting time. Um, and this would be around 2013 until around 2017-ish. I did attend Rendezvous in 2014 and had a few like mini videos, but there was a few reasons why I wasn't fingerboarding actively. I would pick up my setup every so often and fingerboard, it's just, I wasn't filming, making content at all. I was focused on real life stuff, you know, my career and, and work and just in general, that type of stuff. End up getting in a relationship too um, during that time period where I didn't fingerboard much at all. It just was a natural, it was a natural time where fingerboarding just didn't become a priority in my life. Now there's a way to make it balance and that's what I'm hoping to do from now on. Great question, and I really hope you do fingerboard. It's such a great hobby and release. Just to, it's such a creative hobby and fun to do, and you can improve so much, and that's why I love fingerboarding. Uh, there's two questions here. Hey, Chris, I'm a huge fan. Thank you. And I think your content is amazing. Thank you. Uh, two questions here. How often do you change your grip? Okay, so that first question... Honestly, I don't change my grip that often. It basically is at the point where it gets pretty nasty is when I change the grip. Or if I need to remove trucks from one setup and put it onto another setup, that's when I'll remove the grip tape from a deck. So there's no, it's not like I change it all the time. In fact, I like to wear them in pretty quickly. I use rib tape and FBS usually. If you know rib tape, it takes a little bit for it to get worn in, but once you wear it in, it's really, really good. And then FBS is good out of the gate and gets even better as it goes on. Um, it really, once it starts to get really sticky on the sides and it starts affecting me doing regular tricks, that's when I'll replace it. Okay, the second question to this is, when is the next Northwest Fingers event in Seattle? That event was super fun. It was super fun, you're absolutely correct. So David, a.k.a. Earl FB, is the one that put on both Northwest Fingers 1 and Northwest Fingers 2. We, we had a little meetup about a month ago where I went over to David's house, filmed on that Black River Park he has, or one of the Black River Parks he has, and we were talking about it. He's really looking for a good venue to host. Um, we outgrew the previous venue, to be honest. We had 80-plus people there. I'm thinking we're going to have way more than that for the next one. Now, there are events that are happening in the Puget Sound area, specifically up in Everett, 
and I know there's a lot of fingerboarders also down in Tacoma. So I think there's an event coming up um, pretty soon in Muckle Teo at the YMCA there. I think it's Groove Fingerboards who makes these amazing, uh, awesome fingerboard bowls and concrete parks and concrete ramps. Um, I haven't met him yet, but I'm looking forward to. So he's hosting some events coming up. And then David has been looking to find a spot to do Northwest Fingers 3, which will be a nice big event, I'm sure. And if you are able to travel, there is some events down in Oregon coming up. We have one in Eugene. I think that's this weekend, actually. Uh, might be a little bit too far for you to get down there. And then in the middle of April, there's an event down in Medford, Oregon, hosted by both Blistered as well as the Pacific Northwest Finger Skate Collective, who put on the previous two return, who put on the fingerboard jam and the return of the fingerboard jam down in Salem, Oregon. Super fun events, guys. So if you can make it down to Oregon, you should check it out. All right, next question. Do trick tips, especially on the really weird fingerboard position, to do flips that you do? Okay, so this is not really so much of a question as a request. Uh, here's what I'll do right now because I am not a believer in trick tips so much. Uh, I started doing this big, huge thing about this big project about getting all the basics to fingerboarding at a beginner's level. And what I found that's more important than just simply trick tips is to have tips around fundamentals. What are the movements that cause the boards to do certain things that allow you to do certain tricks? So if you break it down to its essentials, what are movements that really can help you improve your fingerboarding holistically. So for upside down, this is a specific trick that really, well not even a trick, this is a specific tip that really helped me break through to understanding how to really get these tricks down. And that is if you're like this, upside down, all you need to do to pop the board is turn your hand over, okay? That's all that pop is. And once I had that realization, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, maybe even longer than that, the tricks became really easy to do. I shouldn't say easy, they're still tricky because you're still trying to focus on doing the flips in awkward finger positionings. You don't have the same grip with your fingernail as you do with your finger pad. But anyway, so once you learn that when you pop, you're just turning your hand over, it became a lot easier. Now, upside down switch is different because you can't, up, you can't really do it that, like, you can't turn your hand over like that as easy. You have to like rotate. So instead, um, you do a partial turn and then you move your fingers up into this from here to here and you twist your wrist a little bit. And that gives you just enough pop if you do it swift enough to get the board up into the air like that. And then it's just about practice and rote memorization of those movements. And then once you get it down, it comes a lot easier. It really is all about practice and focusing on specific movements to do those tricks. When did you go from playing with tech decks to being really good at fingerboarding? Good question. So I started fingerboarding in a hardcore level back in 1998 when tech deck was around. My middle school was like a mecca for fingerboarding. We had even another pro fingerboarder um, that came from my middle school, who's about a couple years younger than me, but I was classmates with um, his brother, actually. And I kind of stumbled upon this, and his name was Jared Felicetti. So everyone in my school was fingerboarding. Um, this is before we had any of those VHS tapes that came out in 1999, like Flying Fingers and Fingers of Fury. But we fig figured out how to fingerboard um, our own way. So what we would do to, uh, to pop the board in the air and do tricks was tap the tail like that. Some of us would do this mini chop, chopping motion down and control the board that way. And so we learned that we could control the board and do ollies like that. We also learned that you could do flip tricks. It can be a little, a little harder. That was a shove it, but there we go. That was a varial flip, but anyway, we learned how to do tricks that way. And then we saw Fingers of Fury and, and Flying Fingers when they released as part of the package with Tech Dex. And that blew our minds. And I realized that I wanted to fingerboard like Darren Langhorst, Matt Johnson, Damien Bernadette, and Tony Potex. So I changed my style completely. And you'll see 1989, that's when I started to get 
a lot better than your average fingerboarder. Like I'd say I was probably one of the best at that time. If you look at all the other fingerboarders outside of those four and Martin Winkler and a few others like uh, Dennis Stemak, I was probably pretty close to the best at that time outside of those people because they were better than I was. Can you do an unboxing slash review of Pop Deck? They are awesome decks. I agree with that. Tom from Pop makes amazing boards. I've actually had a Pop Deck before. I really like it. Um, in terms of reviews, I'm super backlogged right now. I have so much stuff that I need to review um, that I made promises. That's a problem in a way. Like It's nice to get stuff to try out for free, I guess. At the same time, I, I have to fulfill these obligations before I do that. But yes, in the future, I will absolutely do a review on Pop Decks because they're, they're a great company. How long did it take for you to learn Nolly Heels and any tips on how to? Great question. The Nolly Heel was like my arch nemesis forever. Um, I probably learned them in 2000, but I didn't get consistent at them until around 2008, 2009. And that's when I changed my style on how to do them to become consistent. Like you'll see in my old video parts, I definitely do nollie heels into grinds and slides and I would do them down stuff. And I probably looked like I was really good at them, but I was actually not. And part of that's because we were doing these tricks on tech decks and that was considered the hardest trick you could do at the time, really. I mean, there was harder tricks for sure, but like that's what everybody thought you needed to do to be good, which continues to this day. It's kind of a, a, a gateway trick. I used to do them like this. I see a lot of fingerboarders do it this way now. Finger curl up front, right? But then I realized I could change to this style, flat fingered, and be way more consistent and get better height. And so that's my preferred method is finger pad method. And so tips, depending on how you want to do your trick, if you're doing the finger pad method like I'm doing, you want your finger positioning like this, you're going to pop. It causes the board to lift up a little bit like that. And then when you go up, forward, and out, and it's not a big drastic motion like a lot of people will throw their hand out and expect the board to rotate a uh, heel flip, you don't need to do that much movement. It's really just feeling that board coming off your first knuckle, and then once you figure that motion out and can feel it, you'll start getting way more consistent. Just focus on that feeling of the board coming past your first knuckle like that, and if you focus on that, that flip is going to happen most of the time. Now for the other method like this, again, I think the big tip I have is it's a swift, short movement. It's not an exaggerated forward and out movement. It's really a up with your hand, a little bit of a down with your finger, and up and out with your wrist like that. You don't need much movement. That's the biggest tip I have for people doing switch and nollie heel flips. Favorite wheel. My favorite wheel is the flat face G4 shape. I love that wheel. Um, and in terms of the material, I love the clear material personally, especially if I can get like a quartz or the Arctic swirls. I just love the way they look. I love the way they feel. Um, yeah, that's my favorite wheel of all time. Is the new video part dropping? I actually have a video part that's going to be in an upcoming video. I don't know when it's going to release, but it's getting edited right, at, right now by somebody else. So I will promote that video once it releases on this channel. What do you think about Obsias trucks and other new trucks that are coming out? There's so much cool stuff coming out. Obsias has a completely different shape from anything that I've seen. I am really impressed with their customer service. I got to say, when they had... When they first released their truck, they had some quality control issues in terms of their design and their axles were kind of snapping off because it's all one piece um, with the truck. And so they were having a big issue of customers saying, hey, my truck's broke. And you know what they did? Not only did they quickly address the issue, they redesigned the truck, they gave everybody a new truck hangers, and they gave them a set of wheels. Like... That is super professional. I love to see that. Um, I can't say enough good things about the customer service. I have yet to try the trucks themselves, so I don't have anything to say negative or positive about the truck design. I do like the way they look. I do like the lit. I do like the way they look. They look unique. They don't look like anything out there, which is really important to me. Is 
not being a ripoff of another truck company, right? And then in terms of other trucks that are out there, you probably can't get these because these are in China and that's uh, the Soldier Bar trucks. There's also Undead trucks out of Indonesia. Gosh, there's, uh, I forgot the name of the truck company out of Mexico that's making trucks. It's just, we're in a great time, guys. We have so many options for professional fingerboard trucks like UAG, Y trucks, Dynamic, uh, Black River trucks, and so on, like Vortex. You can go on. There's just so much options at a high level of unique quality professional fingerboard gear. We're in a fantastic time. Question here, please touch on deck lengths. I have always used flat face and I've recently got a civil made in the mail and it's 96 millimeter long and I thought it was the tiniest thing. 96 millimeters is pretty tiny. Um, I agree with you. Um, I also have long fingers and no one really touches upon this. It's interesting uh, how shapes preferences have evolved over time. Like we've gotten wider in terms of most people deck preferences, but shorter in terms of lengths, which if you did that with a real skateboard, it's so unrealistic. I agree, like 96 millimeter, unless you have a skinny board, it's gonna look not proportional and it's gonna be tiny. I prefer anywhere from 98 millimeters to 100 millimeters normally. I can still use the skinnier and shorter decks, but um, I like my deck a little bit longer too. And I think that's something to look at when you're trying fingerboards. Try out your friend's setups if you have anybody that's local that's already has a setup. See if you actually like the setup before you buy. It will save you a lot of money in the long run. I think that's all the YouTube questions. Let's go check out Instagram and see what's going on there in terms of questions that people have for me. I'm located in the Pacific Northwest, Central Washington. When are we gonna meet up? So there's quite a few events that are happening in this summer. I'll be going to some events down in Oregon and any Pacific Northwest area event that's realistic, if I'm not busy, I'll try to be there. I'll be trying to promote some of these on my own channels, whether it's YouTube or Instagram. So check those out, man. And if you're in the area in Seattle, just let me know and we can see if we can meet up. All right, next question. What's your favorite fingerboard part as in full length video part? Oh man, it's a great question. It's probably, Probably Darren Langhorse in Fingers of Fury. Although Matt Johnson's pretty damn close in Flying Fingers and also Mark Winkler's part in Pissing Fingers. I know those are like not really your traditional fingerboard full length parts, but those are ones that really stick out. Um, there's a handful of parts by Taylor Rosenbauer that are just insane. Wolfgag has some crazy mini parts that are like four minutes long that are wild. Those are the ones that really stick out to my mind as my favorites. This is from Local Transmission. This is Carlos. I know why he's asking this question. Hey, Carlos. How do you feel when you get recognized by people in Discord events, etc.? It's really fun. I love it. Uh, and Carlos is referencing this time where I was just jumped onto voice chat or video chat in the Fingerboard Underground Discord. I hadn't been posting much during this time. Uh, this is when I first started getting really active in there again because I was active before but when I came back and We were all fingerboarding and I was just chatting people and Carlos was like my favorite fingerboarder is Chris Daniels or something like that And then everyone's like this is Chris Daniels and he was like holy cannoli <laughs> funny time um, You know, it's it makes me feel really good obviously to when people recognize me and tell me how they feel about my fingerboarding or my videos uh, it makes me want to continue to fingerboard and to make content like this and to pass on, you know, my knowledge and experience and to share fingerboarding with everybody else. I also had this time when I was in Volgaria, Italy for the hands therapy contest. Martin Winkler and I went down there to support that event. It was fantastic, by the way. And we were in this um, candy store that was about, I don't know, a 10 minute walk away from the event location and we ended up getting some candy there. And all of a sudden this parent came up to us and was like, hey, can you guys sign this fingerboard for me? My son it looks up to both of you. And I'm like, oh my gosh, somebody in Italy right now is asking me to sign their kid's deck. And so both Martin and I signed the fingerboard for the kid. Um, I never actually got to meet the kid because he was already at the event while we were at the, co at the candy store. So 
that was that really made me feel crazy. Like I was like, this is wild. What's your favorite slash most fun trick to do? That's two different. I would say that's two different tricks actually. Um, favorite trick all time. Got to be this. Just a kickflip. And the reason why it's my favorite trick of all time is that you can do it so many different ways. And there's always ways to improve it. Um, it's just a trick that everyone, for the most part, when they're getting into fingerboarding, will learn and can do. And it allows you to show your style off. Now, in terms of the most fun trick to do, I think it's the Nolly Tray Body Burial Pivot. I'll try to do one in a few tries. Let's see. Kind of almost. There we go. That's such a fun trick to do. It just flows, feels really nice, looks really cool on camera. All right, next up, favorite up and coming deck company. Oh man, ah, uh, I don't even know. That's a hard question. Um, there's a lot, so I'll just say that. There's a lot of great new deck companies out there. I haven't been able to try them all. Of course, it's impossible. So I'm not gonna have an answer for this question. Why are you so handsome? Because my wife dresses me. All right, guys, this question is from Sail Flip. Felipe is an awesome fingerboarder, makes great content, you should check his channel out, and he is such a good artist. I, I think this guy's awesome. What is the coolest thing that has happened to you thanks to fingerboarding? I would have to say my second trip to Germany was just incredible. Um, thank you to Martin Ehrenberger for making that happen, as well as John Pound, who is Ben Gordon Pound's dad. And it was such a fun trip. I met so many great people through this, made lifelong friends, was able to tour around Europe and live there for like four months. Black River really took care of me and everybody was so kind and nice. <sighs> I miss it so much. I want to move back to Europe because of that. What are three things we, members of the fingerboard community, could do to ensure the community continues to grow and prosper? This is from FB Christopher, shout out to him. This is an awesome question. Number one is to be positive. There's no need to bully or put people down. I hate that. I hate it when people bully people. I think of all the potential fingerboarders that have been driven away from the hobby because of assholes. And I'm not even joking right now, like I, don't like you if you bully. So if you think it's cool to bully, it's not cool. You're F-wording everything up for a hobby. We could have been in a, such a better spot. There could have been a new Mike Schneider. There could have been somebody like Scott B that has been driven out of the hobby because someone was making fun of them because they weren't as skilled in fingerboarding. And you know what? If you do that, quite frankly, you're the one who is not skilled. I'm better than you, most likely. In fact, guarantee I'm better than you, so why are you making fun of people? I don't make fun of people for fingerboarding skill. Sorry for the rant. Number two, the real difference in fingerboarding is made by doing in-person and online fingerboarding events. If there's any way you can help support your local scene or regional scene, you know, do it. Whether it's actually hosting and putting on events, or it's by showing up even. Being a, you know, filming and capturing this event, sharing it on social media, offering prizes for events like that. That's what really is the lifeblood of our new emerging part of fingerboarding, actually. And number three, it goes on with number one about being positive. It's just taking care of each other, meeting people in person, being friendly, continuing to help each other when they need help. This is from Finger Everything. Shout out to Chase. Favorite type of obstacle? It's a good question. <sighs> a good rail is really nice, but I just love transition, like anything that has a unique shape, a spine. I just love these unique sort of features and you'll be seeing something soon, soon that I have in the works. And you'll be seeing something unique soon that I have in the works. How did you start fingerboarding? What makes you love fingerboarding? And does fingerboarding have any benefit to your life? And this question actually has an example. Fingerboarding helps this person cure their epilepsy. So I started fingerboarding, well, it's, I first started fingerboarding in terms of a hardcore level due to tech deck. That was like everywhere at middle school. This was back in 1998, 
all my friends and classmates were playing with them. So that's how I started. Um, what makes me love fingerboarding? There's two different answers to this question and they're both equal weight for me. Number one, it's the people that keeps me going. I meet so many great people through fingerboarding from around the world. We have this common bond together and oftentimes you'll meet somebody and feel like you've known them forever. It brings people together and that's something I really, really love about fingerboarding. And number two, fingerboarding itself, what I love is you can always improve, you can always get better. And there's no finish line. So if you just keep on fingerboarding a little bit every single day with having a mind, with having intention in mind, it just makes it so it's a never ending fun hobby and you're always progressing. It's the most underrated trick in your opinion also the most overhated, I suppose. So this is Flo. Shout out to Flo. He's from the FBU Discord. Law and Flo. Um, I would say varial flips, like for both those questions. Uh, it's kind of underrated. They feel really good if you do them right. Like, they feel so good. Just front finger catch it. It's a nice trick. No one does them, you know? So that'd be probably the most underrated trick. And then, you know, into grind, nothing feels better than doing a vario flip nose grind. Uh, another trick actually, speaking of this, and Flo is a master of this trick, it's a heel flip, right? That trick is so underappreciated and underdone. Uh, but when it's done right, like how Flo does it, it's money. Why do you love me and would you pay on the first date? A non-fingerboard related question, but I'll answer. I'll answer it. So would you pay on the first date? I always attempt to pay on the first date, but if somebody like doesn't want me to and wants to split instead because you know some people don't want to have the power play or whatever, I'm, I'm fine either way. I'm happy to pay for it. Uh, and why do you love me? Because you make a nice quality deck and you're a nice positive influence on the community, Mr. Is the i8 in your profile picture yours? So the BMW i8 is actually my father's car. Um, and he just sold it, got rid of it about, I don't know, a year ago. But, you know, it was such a fun car to drive. I basically drove it all the time because he let me. So it was a fun car. When are you going to review my wheels? And this is from Dogu Wheels from Scotland. Uh, as I said before, I'm so backed up on reviewing stuff. I would love to get to, you know, try reviewing more products, but I need to finish up this batch of reviews and then I'll open it back up and ask people to love to try them out. In fact, since you're in Scotland, I'll actually be in Edinburgh, um, for my wedding in July. Maybe there's an opportunity to meet up. Dream setup or obstacle? Gosh, okay. I've always wanted the G8 park. I just love that park. When I was in Germany or at Mike's, that's the park I always loved to fingerboard on. That is probably my dream, uh, actually available park. Now, in terms of non-sailing park, you'll see something coming up that's actually one of my dream parks, and that will be here pretty soon. You guys will be excited to see it. Any aspirations for fingerboarding? or your thoughts on the future of the scene and where you might like it to go. So for the first questions, aspirations for fingerboarding, I'd love to see us continue to grow, get more exposure. Ideally, you know, what would be really cool is to have like fingerboarding world and national championships that are shown on like ESPN3 or something. And, you know, people might scoff at that idea, but you see it with like cornhole, you see it with yo-yoing, and all these other um, hobbies and sports that are kind of, you know, not well known, I really think we could get to a point where this could be on ESPN3 or something. That'd be so cool. And if not that, I'd love to see it go in terms of the route of like esports, where online Twitch, we have these events that are streaming and there's like professional commentary. You know, we're probably kind of far out from that, but at the same time, not that far out. So that's my aspirations for fingerboarding, to be honest. Um, and the future of the scene, it's kind of like that. I'd love to see where I'd like it to go. And so that kind of answers all three of those questions in the way that
that's where I'd love to see fingerboarding go. Like having some sort of real professional element. We're seeing USA FBL kind of bring this touring vibe around the country. It'd be great to get to the point where we have these marquee landmark events, kind of like what eSports has, and then able to cast it and have professional commentators too that would be involved. If you could bring back any retired Black River obstacle, what would it be? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. I have always wanted to fingerboard on some of those really old Black River parks from like Fast Fingers 4 and Fast Fingers 5, what they had on the old websites even before that actually. Um, back then obstacles were like really tall and they're all like really densely packed into the park. So much options there. There's this one famous one, um, area of one of the Black River parks where it has this like, uh, I think it's two banks on each side and then it curves around like this and they have a, um, curved bench that wraps around that corner. I, you know, Martin Winkler did tricks on that. Timo Kranz and Matthias Juncker also. That would be something I'd love to sash because it has so much history and memories for me as a young fingerboarder. I'd be in like nostalgia heaven. I've actually seen a, that park over in storage at Black River actually. How to best prioritize upgrades slash style testing. Find myself going broke or fear of missing out over different wheel sizes, deck cuts, truck weights, etc. That's a, uh, I think most fingerboarders go through this. Um, here's the thing. Your setup does matter to a point, but it's the setup's not going to make you a better fingerboarder. It's going to help out make it a little easier if you get the right setup. A great setup is going to feel really good. Now, remember, preferences are huge. And also hype also influences what people recommend. Just don't get into the hype. You know, if you go to a fingerboard event, try someone's setup, and you really like theirs better than yours, like actually like it better, and it's just not like the grass is greener, consider getting one of those decks. That way you've already tried the setup. You already know what trucks are on it, what wheels are on it. That's a recommendation I would have. Um, you can't go wrong with the highest end of fingerboarding gear, to be honest. It's a lot of money, but Black River trucks, Dynamic trucks, flat face wheels, those are all stuff that have been around forever and haven't changed much because they're good. What is your favorite flip to grind trick? I think it's a kickflip backside 50-50. And here's why. Because it's a very simple trick. It's all about control. And you can make this trick a lot harder just by popping it from the mid rail. So there's a lot of like variability to this too. It's something you can be really good and consistent at, but you can make it harder by popping it from out here. That's probably my favorite trick. What trick took you longest to learn and also any tricks you can never learn? Um, well, in terms of flat ground tricks, the trick that was hardest for me to get consistent was nolly heel flips. That took years and it completely changed in how I approached the trick to become consistent at it. So if you start in 1998, I first learned them in 2000 and I was not that consistent because of how I did the tricks. Plus we're doing it on tech decks. I would say I, I wasn't consistent at Nolly or switch heel flips until around 2007, 2008, when I changed from a curled finger approach to switch and Nolly heel flips to flat finger approached. And then I focused on having that feeling off the knuckle. That completely was a game changer and it makes it so it's one of my most consistent tricks because of that. Now any tricks I haven't been able to learn in terms of flat ground, I mean, yes, because I don't, but any trick I've actually focused on, I was able to learn, to be honest, in terms of flat ground tricks. There have been like grind tricks and slide combos. They're usually combos. Like if I'm going to do nolly tray, crooked grind, nolly tray, crooked grind, nolly tray out, I would never try to learn that trick. It just not interested. So yeah, there's tricks I haven't been able to learn, but um, there's never been a trick I had a goal of landing and I really wanted to that I haven't been able to land and so I guess it's kind of a yes and no. Dream fingerboard to own? It's a good question. I would love to have some of the very early tech decks like the ones that I've already owned like my first setup I really wish I didn't lose that that was taken away from me in class that would be my dream fingerboard to be honest and I know it's kind of a weird answer uh yeah that might be it and then other fingerboards that are dreams for me to own, I'd love to have some, like a collection of preets. 
Like, Preets are one of my favorite decks. Um, I love Peter. He's, he lived with me for a while in Germany. Um, they're some of the best decks out there, and that'd be my dream is to have a collection of that. And, and Gripskin, so it's two. Bonus question. Favorite public spots to seek out and to shred? That's an awesome question. So I have two answers to this. One, over in Munich, they have some of those favorite spots that you've seen. And then another spot locally over in Bellevue downtown near the public library. There's a couple spots there I love. And one of them is just this perfect granite like art installation that is so much fun to fingerboard. If you've watched my Instagram channel, you've probably seen me fingerboard there. Um, next question, will you try my board? As I said, I I'm so backed up on reviewing stuff. I have like five decks that I promise people that I have to review and I'm trying to do them in order and uh, I don't have enough trucks and wheels to try them all out at once. So I'm kind of going through them and then I have some more trucks coming, more wheels coming. So hopefully I can get through this backlog, get everyone happy from there. And then I may open up things up to have more reviews and to catch up on things. How can someone be a Black River rider? I think the most important thing here is you, number one, I was not a Black River Rider due to my skill at fingerboarding. I am a really good fingerboarder, no doubt about that. But if you're looking at why Black River put me on the team, it's one, because I would go to events and support it. I flew across the country with my own money to get to rendezvous. And I met Black River through there. I became friends with them there. And then that same trip, they added me to the team. So they were, they liked me. That's the truth. It's they saw that I fit on the team because I got along with everybody. On top of that, I was doing Fingerboard Weekly at the time, which was a blog that shared fingerboard news around the world, kind of like what Fingerboard TV does too. Um, and so I was also pushing the scene there. I was an administrator of an FFI. It was a lot of work. I didn't do that with the intention of getting sponsored by Black River. I was just doing it because I love fingerboarding. So if you focus on loving fingerboarding, and you're actively supporting fingerboarding and going to events and helping out fingerboarding, you know, maybe there's a shot if you meet Black River one day and are at the events and you get befriend a few members of the team and you meet Martin Ehrenberger and all that, there's a shot you could get sponsored by them. But it's not going to be due to really skill as much as the whole package of what you're bringing to Black River. Top three obstacles of all time. This is number one. I can tell you that. Rainbow Rail. It's so much fun. Just like one of my favorite fingerboard obstacles to ride. It makes fingerboarding fun. You can use this to pop tricks up and over if you want to. You can do like a switch flip. I can do a backside tail, switch flip, backside tail on it. it just feels so good. Um, I really like this patchwork quarter recently. I'm not that good at it yet, but this one's a fun one to do. And then for number three, I would have to say is the Winkler Mini. It's just so much utility. And I'm not talking about the Pocket Mini. I'm talking about the, the Mini Ramp from Black River. I fingerboarded that so often. And I need to get that out of storage and set that up again and start fingerboarding again. It's so much fun to have good transition. You can spend hours on it. Do me a favor guys, tap that like button if you enjoyed this video. If you want to see more content like this, leave me a comment down below. Tap that subscribe button if you haven't already, and I will see you next time. Peace.